Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the live stream. All right, so now I'm going to cover... Uh, uh, I have a special guest with us right now to help us break down the Rittenhouse story. Uh, he's a former police officer, criminal justice adjunct professor. He's received the National Stand Award from the American Civil Liberties Union for his work on criminal justice reform and police misconduct. He's the host of the progressive radio show News Views with Garland Nixon and a political analyst in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Garland Nixon. Hi, Garland. It's good to see you. Hey, thanks for inviting me, Jimmy. Okay, so now you have a, a great take on this. I just want to set this up for a little bit, and then I'm going to come back and have you jump in. And uh, So I just want to, my focus on this story, I was just like everybody else. I just wasn't paying much attention to it, reading the headlines, and I thought like this gentleman, Alex Cole, that Kyle Rittenhouse is so lucky that he's white and he only killed black people. I'm sorry, guys, but the judge is going to let this guy walk free. Um, so... I thought the same thing. I thought he killed black people because I didn't look that far into it. And then this one woman, Sarah Beth Burwick, tweeted out, I'm highly educated and reasonably perceptive, and it was only today that I learned that Kyle Rittenhouse victims were white. My progressive bubble made this seem like a very different case than it is. And then she gives an example. This is from Newsweek, and she says, another article that calls this a racially charged trial, but conveniently omits the fact that everyone involved is white. Now, now do you see why someone who's not paying close attention would think that Kyle Rittenhouse shot black people. And so here, by the way, is Matt Taibbi. The Rittenhouse verdict is only shocking if you followed the last year of terrible reporting. In the tinderbox, in a tinderbox situation like this one, it was reckless beyond belief for analysts to tell audiences Rittenhouse was a murderer when many, if not most of them, had a good idea he would be acquitted. But that's exactly what most outlets did. And now here's Glenn Greenwell with a very brief summary of the media's failures on this. Now, obviously, this has been a trial that has. And I have it speeded up. So don't he doesn't he doesn't speak that. I did extreme levels of emotion. I know just by having gone on and made clear uh, not only what the verdict was, but what my view was having watched the actual trial, namely that this was the just verdict based solely on the evidence, the amount of both ecstasy on the one hand from people who were hoping for an acquittal, but also the amount of contempt and hatred and rage and indignation aimed at me and lots of other people for those who are hoping for a conviction was far more intense than the normal trial, criminal trial or civil trial would generate. And there's reasons for that that I think are very disturbing, particularly the fact that the narrative that has been constructed by the national media around this case almost from the start was not just completely fictitious and unrelated to the evidence, but was designed to be as inflammatory as possible. From the very beginning, the narrative was that this 17 year old white kid who was a white supremacist terrorist crossed state lines in order to go somewhere implied that he had nothing to do with when in fact it was a community, Kenosha, Wisconsin, right over the border where he lived, that he had substantial ties to, where he had worked, where his parents had lived, where his relatives had lived, where he had spent the day, where his friends lived, that he had a lot of connections to. Crossing state lines was this technicality that happens when you live on the border, not some nefarious act, but they would stress that he crossed state lines as though he was going looking to a, a neighborhood that or a community in which he had no involvement or to which he had no connection. And he just indiscriminately shot whoever he could find. That was absolutely the narrative you can find viral tweets from members of Congress, like Ayanna Presley the day that it happened, the next day, obviously there's no way in a complex situation like that with lots of shooting going on to know the truth so definitively. And yet they didn't care. They asserted the truth as though they knew exactly what happened. And what they claimed what happened was what happened was that a white supremacist terrorist had gone and indiscriminately murdered people, a 17 year old white kid. And this narrative was carried through with so much united force by the media. And it was so deliberate. News outlets that always tell you what the victim of the race, uh, the, the race of the victim is. If there's a police shooting and the victim is black or there's a uh, political fight and someone gets injured and the victim is a racial minority or is LGBT or is Asian or anything else, the media will highlight that and stress that to racialize the narrative as much as possible. In this case, the media hid, barely mentioned. I mean, you can find some accounts buried in it, but many news articles, long news articles would go out of their way not to mention the fact that the three people that Kyle Rittenhouse shot were all white. Because obviously that is contrary to their narrative. It's an important journalistic fact if you're going to racialize the event by claiming that this was a white supremacist, it's kind of relevant if he's engaged in white supremacist terrorism, that he goes to a place where there's people of every race, including many, many black people, and the people that he shoots are only white. That kind of calls into question, was his motive actually white supremacist terrorist that the people that he shot weren't black or other minorities, but white, so they just buried it, concealed it to the point that many major media outlets around the world didn't know that the people that he shot were white. This week in Brazil, the largest newspaper in Brazil, Folio of Sao Paulo, which is a very responsible and solid, competent professional news organization. I've worked with them before. I know a lot of reporters who work in that news organization published a major article about the Rittenhouse story, and they specifically and explicitly stated that the people that Kyle Rittenhouse killed were two black men. 
the headline of the story was white youth who shot and killed two black men on trial. They didn't know that they were lying. They got that from the US media. That was the impression the US media deliberately created. And so there are millions of people indignant that Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted, not because they evaluated the evidence at the trial. Many of them, I would bet you most of them, the vast, vast majority of them did not watch much of the trial or any of the trial at all. They don't see this as a case where the state has the responsibility to prove guilt beyond, an, beyond a reasonable doubt before sending an 18 year old uh, person, a citizen to prison for the next three decades or four decades of the rest of his life as just a criminal matter where the state has a constitutional burden that has to meet before they, they don't care about any of that, which is why they have such strong opinions about it despite having not watched the trial. They see this as just a proxy for a political war. So that's very well said. And now I'll, I'll, I see everybody discussing this case when they discuss it. They don't show any relevant video. So I'm going to show you the relevant video. We've showed this once before on our show. And then I'm going to bring in Garland. And then we're going to discuss the, the actual evidence because he's also looked into the actual evidence. And we'll see where we agree. We'll see where we disagree. But here we go. Al Rittenhouse case. Rittenhouse purchased an AR-15 rifle through his older friend, Dominique Black. Black is now facing charges for providing the gun to Rittenhouse, who was only 17 at the time. The gun was kept by Black's stepfather at Black's stepfather's house in a safe. Rittenhouse practiced target shooting with the adult supervision of Black's stepfather, which is legal. The plan was to transfer ownership to Rittenhouse when he turned 18. On August 24th, after finishing his lifeguard shift at a pool in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Rittenhouse and Black spent the evening at Black's stepfather's house. There they watched live streams of groups protesting the police shooting of Jacob Blake. At night, the groups had turned violent, vandalizing and burning local businesses. In response to the unrest, Black's stepfather says he took the guns out of his gun safe for personal protection. The next day, at 10 a.m., Rittenhouse, his sister, and Black set out to help clean up local businesses. Rittenhouse can be seen here removing graffiti from a local high school. That same morning, Joseph Rosenbaum, who would later become the first man shot by Rittenhouse, was released from a mental hospital. He had recently overdosed on pills in an apparent suicide attempt after he physically assaulted his fiance. After being released, Rosenbaum visited his fiance, but she would not let him spend the night. She said she feared he'd be arrested for violating a court order to stay away from her. She also says that she warned Rosenbaum to not go downtown and does not know why he did. As far as that night, I have absolutely no idea why he was downtown. None, none whatsoever. Later that night, Rosenbaum is seen pushing a flaming dumpster towards a gas station. When others put out the dumpster fire, Rosenbaum tries to start a fight over it and begins yelling at armed citizens. That night, Rittenhouse and Black were armed with rifles protecting Car Source, a business that had been vandalized the night before. For this, Rittenhouse is currently charged with possessing a dangerous weapon under the age of 18. That night, Rittenhouse also carried a med pack, offering care to injured protesters. There's a, there's a medic right here if you need help. What do you want? She got shot. All right, we're going to go over here. I have an EMT. If you are injured, come to me. Later, Rittenhouse is seen with a fire extinguisher running towards another Car Source lot where protesters are breaking into cars and setting fires. We've seen at least four people with handguns running around here. Three or four subjects trying to light cars on fire. It is in this lot that Rittenhouse has his fatal encounter with Rosenbaum. But it was another man, Joshua Zeminski, who had been protesting with Rosenbaum that would fire the first shot. A camera filming cars getting smashed pans. And we see the 6'5 Joshua Zeminski step towards Rittenhouse. Zeminski's girlfriend motions towards Rittenhouse with her arm. Rosenbaum, now with his shirt off and wrapped around his face as a mask, lunges towards Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse runs away. Rosenbaum chases Rittenhouse. Rosenbaum throws a bag with his items from the mental hospital at Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse turns around, then turns back around and keeps running away. As Rosenbaum continues to chase Rittenhouse, Zeminski lifts his gun into the air and fires. Oh, they you. The muzzle flash from Zeminski's gunshot can be seen from this angle. Rosenbaum keeps pursuing Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse runs into a bunch of parked cars, turns around and fires four shots at Rosenbaum. Someone else fires three shots. Rosenbaum was taken to the local hospital and pronounced dead that night. Unfortunately, the bloodshed continued. But before we move on to the next shootings, let's review each camera angle available. While viewing, I ask you, the jury, to consider whether this is murder or self-defense. According to Wisconsin state law, 
a person may employ deadly force against another if the person reasonably believes that force is necessary to protect oneself from imminent death or great bodily harm. So the question is, was it reasonable for Kyle Rittenhouse to believe that he faced imminent death or great bodily harm? Here are all the camera angles. Oh, damn. Whoop it. Damn. Hey. So the orders, the orders you hear about yelling no cameras, there was white boys. Yeah, that's Antifa, man. Oh, we got a gun, baby. Oh, they shoot. Oh, he shot him. After shooting Rosenbaum, Rittenhouse circles back and looks at Rosenbaum's body. Then Rittenhouse makes a phone call to his friend Black. Rittenhouse frantically talks on the phone as he runs away. This dude running did it. Take screenshots. That dude shot him. That shot that dude! Crane him that boy! He just shot a man! Get that motherfucker! As Rittenhouse runs from an angry crowd, Gage Grosskreutz runs up to Rittenhouse and asks him what he's doing. Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Hey, stop him! One individual hits Rittenhouse in the head. Rittenhouse keeps running, but eventually falls. An unidentified man tries to jump kick Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse fires a shot. Anthony Huber hits Rittenhouse with the skateboard and grabs the rifle. Rittenhouse fires a shot, killing Huber. Gage Grosskreutz pauses and puts his hands up. Rittenhouse holds fire. Grosskreutz lunges towards him with a gun in his right hand. Rittenhouse shoots Grosskreutz in his right arm. So I just want to recap, and I'm going to play it again. I just want to recap what just happened there. He was running away. He was being attacked by Rosenbaum. And his Rosenbaum's buddy shoots a gun as he's chasing him. He turns around, drops Rosenbaum, and starts running towards the cops. The guy he just shot in the arm runs up to him. Hey, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to get the cops. And I don't know if you can tell, but uh, the cops are a half a block away. He was almost to the cops when the, pe when the mob knocked him down and started beating him up. So a guy kicks him in the face. Another guy hits him over the head with a skateboard, tries to grab his gun. And then that guy actually pulls a gun on him. And that's when he shoots him. But at first, the guy had his arms up and he didn't shoot him. He held off. And then when he took his gun, his hand out and pointed it, that's when he shot him. I just want to, we're going to recap it. Here it goes. Here it is one more time at normal speed. After Rittenhouse shoots Grosskreutz, the crowd stops pursuing Rittenhouse, and Rittenhouse gets up. Then, an unknown individual or individuals fire eight shots. A lot of shooting going Rittenhouse on. Rittenhouse runs towards the police. So you see where the, co the cops are right there. They've been there. And he was running towards them, and they stopped him before. So it's one thing to stop a guy who's an active shooter. If there's an active shooter and then you rush him, that's an act of bravery. If the guy is running away from the crowd, not shooting anyone, and running towards the cops, and then you attack him, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And uh, that's not stopping an active shooter. Now, another thing I'll say right here is that if he was black and he had a rifle— and he was going towards the cops, cops would probably have shot him. So there's the part where racism plays. But let's finish this. Rittenhouse appears to surrender with his hands up. Hey, he just shot them. Hey, dude right here just shot them. Dude right here just shot all them down there. That dude just shot them up there. That dude right here. Yeah. The 
police drive past Rittenhouse. Later, Rittenhouse gets a ride home from Black, and Rittenhouse's mother drives him to the local police station, where Rittenhouse turns himself in. <laughs> so again, as the jury, it's up to you to decide. Okay. So for putting that video together to tell the true story, uh, Matt was called a, p a piece of shit online and r a racist and everything. And here's one more piece of video that I think is super relevant. Here's the guy who pulled the gun on a uh, written house who got shot. Uh, and here's his testimony. When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until... So he, he came at... Rittenhouse, he had a gun in his hand, but he put his hands up like this. And so Rittenhouse didn't shoot. And then this guy puts his points his gun at him, and that's when he shot him in the arm. He's going to admit that. Watch. You pointed your gun at him, advanced on him with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him. Then he fired, right? Correct. Correct. Now, again, this and, is... Uh, good, on Good Morning America today, you said okay. that you were... Okay. And then he lies. Uh, so let me go ahead and bring in uh, Garland Nixon. Let me in reintroduce him because it's been a long segment. He's a former police officer, criminal justice adjunct professor, received the National Stand Award from the American Civil Liberties Union for his work on criminal justice reform and police misconduct. He is the host of the progressive radio show News Views with Garland Nixon and a political analyst in Washington. Now, Garland, let, now you've looked into this. And what what would you like to add, say about the video I just played? Is, was, well, was, sure. Well, what I did very, you know, I wouldn't say er, as early as I should have because I was probably bamboozled for a while, and I heard, um, you know, all of the stuff on on uh, online and all of the rhetoric about it, and so I decided to do what you know, based on my area of expertise, I felt I should do, and I went online and started digging. I didn't even see the videos for a long time, and I thought, well. What you know, based on what I see, what were what will a jury rule on, et cetera? And I came to the conclusion that the jury would rule on one of two things that they would rule on I, uh, either the broad circumstance, which the argument would be you cannot create a dangerous environment and then shoot your way out of it. That would be the broad circumstance or the narrow circumstance, which would be at the time the defendant used lethal force. Did they have a legitimate fear for their life or significant bodily harm? Based on my experience, I felt they would um, rule on the latter. After I saw the videos, I realized it wouldn't matter because there was not a credible argument that um, Rittenhouse created a dangerous environment. He put himself, he entered a dangerous environment, but there were other guns and things like that. And then I just went, okay, we've got three different victims. Let me go one, starting with the last one, one, two, three, and see will I, will I get an acquittal. I looked at the first one and I'm like, well, this guy apparently pointed a gun at him. There's no way that a jury is going to find him guilty. Any jury is going to look at that and say there was a gun pointed at you at the time you used force you had um, a reasonable fear for your life i looked at the second one the middle one and i realized that he was being struck in the head with a state with a skateboard at the time he used lethal force certainly a jury is not going to um you know find is not going to find him guilty there they're going to say okay you're being struck in the head with a heavy object Clearly, you had a reasonable fear for your life. I said, so those two are done, definite acquittals there. Then I went back to the first one with Rosenbaum. And when I found out that Rosenbaum was chasing him, at the time Rosenbaum was chasing him, Rosenbaum, someone fired a round and he heard the round fired while he's being shot. I guess, obviously, he would make an assumption that Rosenbaum or someone else involved with Rosenbaum, and it turned out to be one of the people in the group with Rosenbaum, that um, he would make the assumption he's being shot at and he's gonna fire. I felt that if there were any of the three any possibility of the three of any of the three that there'd be a conviction, it'd be Rosenbaum, but I doubted it very seriously. So I just my my position was I, I project a full acquittal on all three. And that was just based on the facts, my expertise. And um, it, it seemed pretty cut and dry to me. I will say this. 
Initially, I was surprised because I had a lot of people that I approached with that. And when I found out how little people knew about the case and the kind of visceral reaction that I would get from people, even though they could not argue the facts, they would kind of cringe in horror like, oh, no, you know, I don't want to hear this, but he's a bad guy. And I realized it had become the villain hero scenario, whereas if you're on Fox News or if you're a conservative, he's a hero. If you're MSNBC or one of the blue no matter who people, he's a villain. And they had taken those positions and they didn't want to hear any critical thinking. Um, They didn't want to see any critical thinking brought into the equation. And so that's remarkable. uh, And there's but it's still happening. Right. And it's I, I totally blame the media for fanning the flames of the, you know, there, there is real racial tension in America. We don't need the media to keep stoking it at every turn. And to me, it seems like they'd rather have us fighting each other than keeping our eye on the oligarchy, because that's what's had at every turn. We're being split apart as a country uh, by the oligarchy and their establishment media, because it's only owned by billionaires. There's only six media companies in the whole country, and they don't want us to come together and fight back against the oligarchy, which has been flattening our ass for 45 years, and it's really ramped it up since COVID. They don't want us to come together. They want us to stay apart, and they want to keep stoking these racial flames uh not that there isn't uh, okay so when a lot of people said well if he was black he would have been convicted there's a good chance he would have been or a better chance and i agree with that i don't disagree that the racial justice system is unbelievably racist guess who and guess who guess who is the architect of that joe biden Okay, so uh, he's the architect of that criminal. So the answer to the criminal racial, uh, uh, the uh, racist criminal justice system isn't to treat more people unjustly. It's not to cheer on someone else's oppression. It is to cheer your own emancipation from oppression. The key to fixing criminal racist criminal justice isn't to expand it. It's to get rid of it. Would you agree with that? Yes. And and so, so what we have here is this. When you look at that case, clearly there's an evidence for acquittal. And when you make the argument, if someone said to me, if Kyle Rittenhouse were black in the exact same circumstances, as you said, he'd have been shot in the street by the police as soon as they saw him with a long gun. Right. And when he went to court, my prediction would be much more difficult because I'd say based on the facts, he should be acquitted. However, he's black and he shot some white people. Uh, 50-50. He may be convicted. So it when you add the context of race, actually, yes, you're, you're, you, you are correct. The unfortunate thing about the whole media uh, situation is this. You know, when I watched, um, whenever I watched people in the street and there's protests and there's violence, et cetera, I think to myself, you know, the, the oligarchs who, who multiplied their fortunes exponentially over the last two years during the, the, the COVID crisis, the happiest thing that can happen to them is to see working class people beating the living hell out of each other in the streets. Um, to see cops. I was a cop. Guess what? I was in a union. I was a working class person. That's a blue collar job, right? The happiest thing they can see is for people who are um, who are all in the same boat economically fighting and beating themselves to death. We're not making $30,000 a show like Rachel Maddow. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to, so I just, just to reinforce, uh, the Washington Post did their uh, uh, visual forensics of this. And they left out all kinds of important details. One of them was that that guy was carrying a gun and pointed it at Rittenhouse. They left. They omitted that from it. So I I, again, I blame uh, I I blame the the press for doing this. Uh, There was another thing I want to bring this up because someone called into your radio show and asked you about this. And I've been making fun of it. Right. So people have been stressing that he crossed straight lines. And here's a funny video. I think this is it. Is this in Kenosha, Wisconsin, a state that he does not live in? He traveled there from out of state and he crossed state lines, meaning he traveled across state lines. The 17 year old who crossed state lines. Now, again, he drove from Illinois to Wisconsin, the 17-year-old from out of state 
who shows up to Kenosha, Wisconsin. He drove from Illinois to Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kyle Rittenhouse, who again uh, traveled across state lines in a state that he doesn't even live in, and then he crossed state lines with it. it <laughs> okay, it makes me laugh because it's a meaningless talking point. It Kyle Rittenhouse lived one mile from the border of Wisconsin, and Kenosha was about 20 miles away from his house. I've been to Kenosha, Wisconsin. I've told jokes in was Kenosha, Wisconsin, because I'm from Chicago, and it's only about 45 minutes. Guess what? I destroyed on that show in Kenosha, Wisconsin, so I also crossed state lines and well, killed. Well, Jimmy, the thing about it is, and this is unfortunate, but in the media now that we have now, um, that's a soundbite. And what they push is sound bites, kind of like the hook on a song that makes you really like the song. Mm -hmm. And I found in discussing these things with people, when you run up against a soundbite with empirical data, with facts, guess what? You lose because sound bites trigger emotions. And yes. that's what our, um, you know, propagandized media, media is, is accustomed to doing. I did find at some point that I could temper this. The only way I could do it is after I would go over the um, the Rittenhouse uh, stuff, I would go to the Ahmad Arbery case. And then I would say, I would go over the details in the Ar Ahmad Arbery case and say, now in that case, it is very clear that there should be a either a first or second degree. I can make an argument for first or second degree murder on that case. First degree murder would be based on something called the felony murder doctrine. However, in the Ahmad Arbery case, because there are what 11 white and one black juror, I would say about 50 50 that you'll get um, either a conviction or a hung jury. So when you take race into this, you know, when you discuss it through the context of race sometimes and add something else, you, it, it, it tempers it. But, but unfortunately, we shouldn't have to do that. But that's where America is. And that's what we're fighting against with the media that makes money off of these types of um, these. They, I mean, they um, sadly, they look forward to this kind of stuff because it allows them to get working class people fighting against each other and beating the hell out of each other and shooting each other in the streets. Boy, you're really nailing it. You're 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 I'm not kidding. I mean, you're you're 100 percent right about this. And, you know, um, when I tried to talk to people after I saw the video and I found out what the real story was, that doesn't mean people like start calling me a Rittenhouse defender. Uh, they always want to call me a right winger. I'm like, no, I, I, I take it on a case by case basis. And I understand that we have an incredibly racist criminal justice system that imprisons black and brown people and over polices them at much greater rates than their population. I understand all that. And I understand that if Rittenhouse was black, he probably would have gotten shot. But I, I agree with all that stuff. So that, that people act like I'm uh, so I just and then you also ran into this same kind of thing where you tried to talk the facts with people and they just want to talk emotions and that's OK. But that doesn't make me the worst thing in the world and it doesn't make me a written house supporter it makes me a person who wants to debunk the false narrative being pushed by the establishment media about this case and they're using it for ratings and they're using it to us to keep us split and that's what the oligarchs want and who do the media work for they work for the oligarchs so i want to show you one more uh, a video. So I came across this today and this uh, uh, woman here was on the Hill and I'm sure she's uh, a good person and good intentioned, but I just want to play this and Garland, how would you handle something like this? This is after the verdict. Well, I wasn't surprised by the verdict, but I do think that the verdict makes a mockery of the doctrine of self-defense. And I think it goes against our modern understanding of self-defense. This idea that you can illegally obtain a gun Go to a place you have no business being, where people are exercised in their First Amendment rights to protest police brutality, a movement that by all intents and purposes you don't appear to support, to act in a manner you have no authority to act, to act as security for buildings and for businesses that you've never been to, that you don't work for in a community that, it, a community that you don't live in. And so, I mean, that's just all filled with untruths, right? So he was a lifeguard in Kenosha. His family lived in Kenosha. He, he was a, lived one mile over the border. He, uh, he, they were at, there's conflicting reports that they were asked to protect that car lot. Uh, in fact, the guys who owned it took pictures with him afterwards. Or, uh, uh, so uh, this idea that he has no business, what does that mean someone has business being there? What did that guy Rosenbaum have business being there? He just got let out of a med. So this, I, this is just you're concocting a narrative that doesn't have anything to do with the facts. I'll play a little bit more and then I'll throw it to you, Garland. Sure. Then when you kill multiple people in the process, you then get to say that you were afraid. 
you know, a person who goes to an event armed with an AR-15 to act voluntarily as security quite literally assumes a risk. They have prepared for violence. They don't get to then say they're afraid. And I think there's something to be said about the fact that no one but Rittenhouse killed anyone at this protest, despite the fact that it was supposedly so dangerous, so out of control, and the protesters are being characterized as such. No one killed anyone but him. Well, he was the only one being attacked by a mob. That's the last that I saw. And the guy, the first guy he shot was a five-time convicted pedophile. So, of course, he's going to go after the youngest-looking guy there. <laughs> That's what I think. I mean, Rittenhouse was 17 years old. He looked like he was 14. And uh, so Rosenbaum's chasing him. And so they're le- So go ahead. Well, how would you respond to this, Garland? Well, here's a couple. To be quite frank, when I hear the things she says, I don't disagree with a lot of that stuff. He okay. shouldn't have put himself into that p- position. It was, uh, it was a bad decision. Right. It was a dangerous decision. There are a lot of things that she's saying okay. that are true. However, if everything she's saying, which is true, which I agree with a lot of it, at the time that he pulled the trigger, the only thing that matters in a court of law is whether he, the, he could um, li- he could credibly argue that he had um, a, a legitimate fear for his life. Based on the evidence, I mean, you can do everything wrong, but when you use lethal force at the time that you use it, do you have a credible argument? So all of the things that she's saying regarding whether he made right decisions, you can talk about it from a racial justice issue, from a social justice issue. But when you get in court, a jury is going to ideally rule on the facts of the case. Another thing about this that I think is unfortunate, you want the jury to rule on the facts of the case. And the fact that that I would argue if he were black, the odds of him being convicted unjustly would rise exponentially. Here's what I would say. I don't want more white people convicted when they shouldn't be convicted. I want less black people convicted yes. when they shouldn't be yeah. convicted. Don't say, well, if you're going to convict us, then convict all the white people. Say, no, no, no. Okay. I want everybody to get a, um, fair trial. A, a, a just outcome. So that's what I'm advocating for also. And, you know, uh, the I screamed just as loud as anybody uh, during the protests last summer about the police brutality. I screamed just as loud as anybody uh, over that. Uh, when the uh, what was that case? The police shot the guy running away in his back, and they got a hung jury off that. That was uh, Michael Slager and Walter Scott. And, and again, in that instant, it was on video. Yeah, video. He shot a black man in the back five times. He then took his taser and he put evidence on the body, and then he filed a false report. All three of those are a criminal charge. And, At least two of them felonies. And he got a hung jury in uh, South Carolina because at least one member of the jury was not going to convict a white officer for shooting a black man under those circumstances. That is a travesty of justice. That being said, I would much prefer that we get a an outcome commensurate with the facts in every particular circumstance than say, well, look, I'm angry at this guy. I don't like what he did. And it will somehow even out the justice system if this white guy gets convicted when the facts don't necessarily align with a conviction. I I disagree with that. Uh, I agree with you. And I appreciate your sober analysis. I appreciate that you come from a law enforcement background, also from a civil liberties background. And I appreciate your sober analysis and I appreciate you coming on. You know, you're sticking your chin out by telling the truth about this because there's going to be people upset with you because you're popping the the narrative, the emotional narrative that they've surrounded themselves in. And now you're 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 going to make them the, if because if they have to question this, then they have to question the media and they have to question who they've been getting their information from for the last four or five or at least the last two years. So that's going to be hard for those people, and they're going to practice a lot of cognitive dissonance. I know you know all this, uh, but I'm just uh, t- saying this so the people who are watching know that too. So- well, well, trust me, Jimmy. I spent uh, from 2016, and you're familiar. You, you, you'd be aware of this. I spent four years saying, you know, I've studied RussiaGate like Aaron. I spent four years saying, oh, this is complete BS from beginning to end. And in Washington, D.C., on a very left-leaning station, so you can imagine every time I did a show on RussiaGate, the phones rang off and everybody said, eh, you're crazy, you don't know what, I had people in the station, you don't know what you're talking yeah. about. And I just kept going. So, you know, if I believe in something, I'm going to say what I believe in and let the chips fall where they may. I, you and I have the exact same experience. I, I was at KPFK. 
And everybody was pushing Russiagate, thought I was crazy, and same thing happened to you. So maybe that's why we relate to each other. Maybe that'll Well, I have a lot of enemies in law enforcement. I actually worked with the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force for a while, and uh, I got a lot of people in law enforcement that don't like Garland Nixon. Ah. So I've got to watch my back, I think. Well, that's hey, that you should wear that as a badge of honor. How about that? All right, brother. Thank you so much, Garland Nixon. Everybody uh, check him out. Where's your website? Uh, well, I don't have one, but they can follow me on Twitter at Garland Nixon and uh, Garland, Garland, uh, just plain old Garland Nixon on Facebook. OK, Garland Nixon. Thank you so much, buddy. We'll see you next Thank time. You. Hey, come see us do a live stand up show in Portland, Oregon, the 26th and 27th of November. That's Thanksgiving weekend. See you there. And please join our premium program. Get a lot of extra stuff. We'll talk to you later. Thank you.